Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India series in renal pathology and today we will be discussing pyelonephritis, obstructive and reflex nephropathy and urolithiasis. Let's talk about the entity called pyelonephritis. Like we talked about tubular interstitial nephritis in our last uh, lecture, pyelonephritis is a renal disorder which affects along with the tubules and interstitium the pelvis as well. Just like tubular interstitial nephritis, it could be acute or chronic. And it mostly represents a serious complication of the extremely common UTI or urinary tract infection that affects the bladder, which we call cystitis. So it's important to remember that every lower urinary tract infection always carries the potential to spread to the kidney to cause the more severe pyelonephritis. How does the infection get to the kidney? There are two ways. The first and more common is the ascending infection where the infecting organisms are usually derived from the patient's own fecal flora, therefore also called endogenous infection. So the infection is mostly by gram-negative bacilli in 85% of cases, most commonly E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella and Enterobacter. You must remember that the normal human bladder and bladder urine is sterile. So how is it that infection enters the bladder and goes up into the kidney? This is a multi-step process. The first step, of course, is colonization of the distal urethra or the introitus in females by these coliform bacteria. Contributing to this are various bacterial factors. The bacteria bear adhesions on their pili and there are certain adhesions which have more propensity to maintain infection in the bladder and thereby predispose to a pyelonephritis. Now, once the distal urethra is colonized, the next step is movement of the bacteria from the urethra to the bladder. Uh, this, of course, is going to be more common in females who have a shorter urethra or post-instrumentation like catheterization. So, step three would be multiplication in the bladder. This would be facilitated by any condition which causes stasis of urine in the bladder. For example, benign prostatic hyperplasia in males, presence of calculi, or neurogenic bladder and diabetics. Now, once you have all the bacteria in the bladder, they need to go up into the kidney. And for that, there needs to be an element of vesicourethral reflux. This could happen because of a congenital cause, such as absence or shortening of the intravesical portion of the ureter. And we'll look at that in detail in the next slide. Or it could be an acquired reflux, uh, which is predisposed to in bladder infections and persistent bladder atony, which can happen in patients with spinal injury. Once the bacteria have traveled up into the ureter, you need a component of intrarenal reflux, which is the last step for the bacteria to enter the kidney. And this tends to happen more commonly in the upper and the lower poles, and we'll see why again in the subsequent slides. So let's discuss reflux nephropathy now. As you can see in this slide, to the left. This is what happens in the normal situation that when the bladder contracts during voiding of urine, the ureteric orifices are pinched close and urine cannot enter into the upper urinary tract. However, if there's any abnormality in the ureter predisposing to reflux, then when the bladder is contracting during voiding, the valve remains open and urine can pass up into the upper urinary tract and cause scarring of the kidneys. One major cause of the cyclo reflex is congenital shortening of the ureter. And this picture here shows us what happens. The ureter has two parts. One part within the bladder is within the muscle, which is the intramural ureter. And then it has a course in the submucosa before it opens into the bladder. In the normal situation, which is situation A, as you can see here, there is a good enough length of the ureter traveling through the muscle before it opens into the submucosa. As a result of it, it will be pinched tightly closed during voiding and therefore there will be no reflux. 
In the situation where the ureter is shorter and has a shorter intramural course, like in situation B here, there would remain a possibility of reflux. And in the situation shown in C here, where there's a very short intramural component of the ureter, reflux would most likely happen. And this is what a biopsy of a patient with reflux nephropathy looks like. The sterile urine which is entering the kidney causes a bland form of damage and fibrosis without the inflammation that we associate with, with pyelonephritis. And what we see really is uh, this creeping bland fibrosis more in the medulla and in the juxtamedullary cortex. And of course, a reflux nephropathy could predispose to a pyelonephritis. And if there is a superimposed pyelonephritis, we would again see the inflammation and the intratubular microapsis formation, as we've seen in the previous slide. So why are the renal poles more prone to both reflux and therefore pyelonephritis? This is related to the development and the embryology of the kidney. In humans also, the kidney starts as a multi-papillary kidney and then fusion of the multiple papillae occur to form uh, what we recognize as the adult human kidney. This fusion tends to occur more at the poles, both the upper and the lower pole. And so as you can see in the picture on the right, when you have more fusion of papillae or formation of what we call compound papillae, the uh, opening of the ducts of Bellini tends to be wider. And therefore, whenever there is reflux of urine, it is easier for the urine to enter into the kidney through these compound papillae. Versus where there is less fusion, which is uh, in the main substance of the kidney and the non-polar area, there you have simple papillae and you can see that they have a very narrow opening and therefore are not so prone to reflux and therefore pyelonephritis. Let's get on to the next mode of infection that is a blood-borne or hematogenous uh, infection. This is a less common uh, form of infection in pyelonephritis and basically what happens is that there is seeding of the kidney by bacteria during a septicemic event or for example infective endocarditis and this And the bacteria that are commonly involved would be staphylococci to a lesser extent E. coli. And you can even have fungal infections with, for example, mucor mycosis uh, presenting as a blood-borne pyelonephritis. And even grossly, you can see a difference uh, in the appearance of the kidney from the two modes of infection. Whereas a hematogenous spread would be associated with the seeding, a miliary kind of appearance in the kidney. Whereas with the ascending infection, you've got this segmental involvement. Uh, with scarring. So how do patients of acute pyelonephritis present? They present with a sudden onset of disease. Presentation with fever and malaise is common along with classical pain at the costovertebral angle and the usual symptoms of a urinary tract infection like dysuria, frequency and urgency. Urine sediment examination as well as urine bacterial cultures would help to clinch the diagnosis. So what do we see in the urine sediment? We will see evidence of infection in the form of biurea, which is all these WBCs in the urine. This is an unstained smear. You may even see bacteria. Here you can see some bacilli in the smear. This of course would also be seen in any cystitis. What does suggest to the pathologist that there is a kidney involvement by this infection is the presence of WBC casts. And you can see them on the right side. Again, you've got the tam hospital protein, which has entrapped all these WBCs. On gross examination, here we have a case of pyelonephritis, which most likely had a hematogenous route of spread. And you can see these miliary uh, So what would be the gross appearance of an acute pyelonephritis? Here in this image, you can see a case in which there was most likely hematogenous spread and the seeding of these small abscesses, which you can also note on microscopy, with bacteria in the center of the abscess. We do sometimes get biopsies of patients. And how do we reach a diagnosis of acute pyelonephritis then? So other than the tubular interstitial involvement, which you do see in any tubular interstitial nephritis, we would usually see evidence of ascending infection in the form of intratubular microabscesses, which are basically these tubules which are suffused in the lumen with numerous neutrophils. The three important complications that you need to remember of acute pyelonephritis are the three P's. First being papillary necrosis, and like we had discussed in the previous uh, lecture, 
The various differentials of papillary necrosis would also include analgesic nephropathy, diabetes, and obstructive uropathy, along with sickle cell anemia. Pyonephrosis. Pyonephrosis is another complication where the kidney is basically replaced by a bag of pus. That's the usual gross description. And that pus can extend into the perinephric tissue and form a perinephric abscess. So these are the three P's which represent complications of acute pyelonephritis. But these are relatively rare and most patients with pyelonephritis will follow a relatively benign course as long as they re uh, receive appropriate antibiotics. Right. If a patient, however, has repeated episodes of acute pyelonephritis, there will be the onset of chronicity and you can get a chronic pyelonephritis, which is an important cause of end-stage renal disease. Now, the two types really of chronic pyelonephritis. One is the chronic obstructive pyelonephritis, in which in the presence of obstruction, repeated bouts of infection cause inflammation and scarring. Or you have reflux nephropathy where the predominant pathogenetic mechanism is the vesicourethral reflux and the sterile urine which is going into the kidney is damaging the kidney which may then have superimposed infections and a secondary pyelonephritis. So compared to acute pyelonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis would have a relatively insidious or even silent onset where patients would present clinically with renal insufficiency and features of hyperuricemia. where patients would present with features of renal insufficiency with hyperuremia, hypertension, polyuria, nocturia, and they may or may not give you a history of recurrent bouts of urinary tract infections or acute pyelonephritis. Compared to acute pyelonephritis, here you can see the gross of a case of chronic pyelonephritis. So if we look at a very classical So compared to the gross that we saw of acute pyelonephritis, here we can see the gross picture of the case of chronic pyelonephritis. And the very classical description of chronic pyelonephritis is of asymmetric, irregularly scarred kidneys. So we can see that the kidney involvement on both sides is different. So there's asymmetry and it's a very irregular pattern of scarring. This is really to differentiate from a chronic glomerulonephritis where we have bilateral, symmetrically scarred kidneys and they tend to be much more fine the scars. The classical appearance of a scar of chronic pyelonephritis can be seen on the cut surface of the kidney as you can see here, where you expect a coarse corticomedullary scar. So the scar is a deep scar which extends from the cortex to the medulla. Again, this is versus a chronic glomerulonephritis where you expect much blunter, shallow scars which are limited to the cortex where the glomeruli are. The scars of chronic pyelonephritis will commonly overlie a dilated, blunted or deformed calyx. And this is a low power view of a patient of chronic pyelonephritis. And you can see this dip on the capsular surface which is really your scar along with the interstitial fibrosis and tubular atrophy. And this scarring extended deep from the cortex to the medulla to overlie the pelvic initial system. Now there are some forms of pyelonephritis that we should be aware of, one of which is xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. This tends to commonly occur with proteus infection along with obstruction and grossly it can look like large yellowish nodules. Of course the yellowish uh, color here would be because of the xanthomatous infiltrate that is these macrophages which are lipid laden along with chronic inflammation. But on gross, the large yellowish nodules may resemble a renal cell carcinoma and a similar mistake can be made on imaging as well. So it's very important to be aware of this entity. So if we have a case of pure reflux nephropathy where only sterile urine is going up into the kidney and damaging it, this is a usual biopsy picture. It's mostly a very bland kind of fibrosis starting in the medulla and going up into the juxtamedullary cortex and it is not associated with the inflammation that we see in a pyelonephritis. So let's move on now to urinary tract obstruction. What happens because of the obstruction and what are the various causes? Of course, the most important consequence of any urinary tract obstruction, as we've already discussed, is an increased susceptibility to infection and therefore pyelonephritis. 
However, in the absence of infection, just an obstructive uropathy can result in a hydronephrosis, which we commonly see. Now let us look at urinary tract obstruction and as we have already discussed this is a very important predisposing factor to pyelonephritis as well as to obstructive uropathy or hydronephrosis. Now uh, obstruction in the urinary tract could be sudden or it could be insidious, it could be partial or complete, unilateral or bilateral and due to intrinsic or extrinsic factors. So this is these are various ways in which we can look at obstruction. Let's look at some important causes according to the level of obstruction. If we start from the bottom in the urethra, a posterior urethral valve is a common developmental anomaly in children, particularly in males, which can predispose uh, to obstruction. Rarely you can have tumors of the urethra in adults. If you look at the prostate, a benign prostatic hyperplasia and adenocarcinoma of the prostate, and sometimes even a severe prostatitis can predispose to obstruction. In the bladder, presence of calculi, bladder tumors, or just a functional problem in the bladder, which is what we call a neurogenic bladder in patients of diabetes or if there is a spinal injury, that's obstruction. If we look at the ureter, ureter can have intrinsic as well as extrinsic causes. Extrinsic causes could be, for example, the physiological state of pregnancy, where you have an enlarged uterus which is pressing on the ureter. Tumors, particularly cervical cancers, or retroperitoneal fibrosis, which can entrap both the ureters and result in obstruction. Various intrinsic causes would include calculi, tumors, blood clots, sloughed papillae in cases of papillary necrosis, and inflammation. And if we go up in the pelvis, large stones, tumors, or strictures. PUJ or pelvi uretric strictures can result in obstruction. So, obstruction or obstructive uropathy presents as hydronephrosis, which is defined as dilation of the renal pelvis and calluses with the urine, and the back pressure would result in progressive renal atrophy. This high pressure in the pelvis transmits back, which I have talked about the back pressure, and all of this also results in compression of the Ileri vasculature producing an ischemic state, and all of this results in atrophy of the renal parenchyma. And that is the classical gross picture of a case of hydronephrosis. Uh, this patient has a pelvic junction stricture, as you can see here, with dilatation of the pelvis, dilatation of all the calluses here, and a markedly thinned out cortex. So, this is a classical hydronephrosis. Now we talked about stones as a cause of obstruction. Let's go into some more details of stone formation in the kidney. Renal calculi can present in patients with symptoms of colic. They can present with symptoms related to obstruction, related to secondary infection, and they can also result in hematuria. We need to remember that there are certain predisposing factors in the urine which predispose to urolithiasis of which supersaturation is most important, along with changes in urinary pH, which predispose to one or the other type of stone, and we'll discuss that in subsequent slides. Any decrease in urinary volume, presence of bacteria, which act as a nidus on which crystal formation and spore formation occurs, and some patients may have deficiency of inhibitors of crystal formation, including pyrophosphates, diphosphonates, nephrocalcin, etc. So, all of these are predisposing factors to uro or nephrolithiasis. There are various theories of formation, one of which is the precipitation crystallization theory, the matrix nucleation theory, or an inhibition of crystallization. So, this table shows us the different types of kidney stones, and as you can see, the most common is calcium oxalate. Approximately 80% of stones that are noted are of calcium oxalate. Smaller percentages are of calcium phosphate, urate, struvite, which is magnesium ammonium phosphate or triple phosphate, and cysteine. The important things to remember clinically is that oxalate, phosphate, 
struvite and cysteine stones tend to be radio opaque however urate stones are radio lucent and therefore can be missed on x ray and in terms of the urinary ph calcium phosphate tends to occur in alkaline ph calcium phosphate and triple phosphate crystals tend to develop in alkaline ph whereas calcium oxalate urate and cysteine tends to develop in acidic ph so if you look at each of these stones this is what we get in the urine we see evidence of crystal urea and the calcium oxalate crystals are classically envelope shaped whereas if you look at calcium phosphate it can either appear amorphous or it can form these needle like crystals so what are the conditions in which we can get calcium oxalate or phosphate stones in 55% of patients there may be evidence of hypercalciuria without hypercalcemia meaning that the calcium levels in the blood would be normal this can be of two types the hypercalciuria it could be absorptive because of hyperabsorption of calcium from the intestine or it could be renal because of intrinsic impairment in renal tubular reabsorption of calcium or of course it could be idiopathic in a smaller percentage of patients you could actually have hyperuricosuric calcium nephrolytic acid with or without hypercalciuria therefore there would be increased uric acid levels in the urine without increased calcium levels in the urine in a small percentage of patients approximately 5% there would also be evidence of increased calcium in the blood therefore hypercalcemia along with hypercalciuria this can be seen in states of hyperparathyroidism diffuse bone disease for example due to metastasis or sarcoidosis The next type of stone is a triple phosphate the magnesium ammonium phosphate or what is also called the struvite stone as i discussed this is more common in alkaline ph and therefore in urine when there is an infection with proteus which is a urea splitting bacteria which will produce large amounts of ammonia and alkalinize the urine patients do commonly get triple phosphate stones mm -hmm. and classically on radiology they describe as staghorn they typically large and they take the shape of the calyx as you can see here and what would we see in the urine we see these crystals with a coffin lid appearance that's the classical description of a triple phosphate crystal move on to urate uh, patients with urate stones tend to have hyperuricemia or hyperuric hyperuricemia hyperuricosuria let's move on to uric acid stones uh, 50% of patients with uric acid stones would show evidence of hyperuricemia or hyperuricosuria but in 50% of patients are idiopathic and we don't really find the increased levels in the urine or blood but we know that there is an association with acidic ph as i had mentioned before these are radiolucent stones and may not be picked up on an x ray and this is what we see in the urine we see these rhomboid kind of crystals translucent crystals of urate cysteine stones are relatively rare uh, they tend to occur in patients who have a genetic defect in reabsorption of cysteine and therefore show cysteinuria these stones also form at a lower or acidic ph and they classically look hexagonal as we can see in this picture so to summarize nephrolithiasis is an important cause of urinary tract obstruction and we've seen that in detail and this urinary tract obstruction can result in an obstructive uropathy or hydronephrosis and predispose to an acute or chronic pyelonephritis and another important predisposing condition for pyelonephritis that we should keep in mind is the cyclohydrotrichic reflux thank you